All right, I'm in Mark chapter 11 today. My text today is going to begin in verse 15. And as you're making your way there, I'm just letting you know I'm going to be reading from the King, New King James Version, which is the one that Jesus read from. You know that, right? <laughs> but uh, no, whatever version you have, I just let you know what version I have uh, before you today. And so as you're making your way there, let's, let's pray and ask God just to bless this incredible Bible study time we're going to have together. And Lord, I do pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Lord, you'd fill each one with your Spirit. Lord, that we would hear from heaven above. We would hear your word speak to our hearts. And Lord, that you'd want to do the work that you purpose to do, Lord, in every single life and every single heart in this room today. And Jesus, we thank you what you did for us on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We never want to forget that. We never want that to be old to us. And we say, thank you, Lord Jesus, deep down in our hearts for what you did for every single one of us in giving us salvation. And now move in a special way in our midst. Touch lives, Lord, today in a very special and powerful way through your word. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus is in Jerusalem for the final time, and this chapter really opens up with his triumphal entry, as you probably saw last time, proclaiming himself publicly to be the Messiah, and the next day as they were leaving Bethany, which is a place often him and his disciples would stay when they're in Jerusalem for the Passover, but as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem from Bethany, he withers a fig tree, and it looks as if it, because it looked as if it didn't have any figs on there when he's coming up to it, so he curses that tree that it'll never produce fruit. Then upon him entering the temples where we pick up today, we begin. This is the day after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, in my text today, we open up with Jesus here exercising authority. We close today with Jesus being questioned about his authority. And sandwiched in between these two things is us having faith in God. For God is our sovereign authority. Thus, we put our faith in God. So Jesus here is exercising his authority on behalf of God's temple in our beginning here. The religious leaders believe that the temple was, you know, their house. Yet Jesus takes the authority to clean what they thought was their house. This was the straw that actually broke the camel's back on them plotting and planning now to destroy Jesus. He went too far in exercising his authority in their house, the temple. But it's not their house. You can't do what you want to do in what is not theirs in the first place. And Jesus makes that very plain and simple here to see. So beginning in verse 15 of chapter 11 of Mark, it says, So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when evening had come, he went out of the city. So in the court of the Gentiles is where these money changers and the selling of animals actually took place, specifically doves, it mentions here. It was the first court a person would come into when they'd enter the temple area. The religious leaders were there taking advantage of a crowd. You know, this was during Passover. And the city was absolutely packed out during Passover. It would be like a city who's hosting the Super Bowl. 
I mean, there's going to be all kinds of activities taking place in that city. Vendors throughout the city is going to be there. And that's what was happening here. People taking advantage of a crowd and making money. And the religious leaders, well, they were no different. No different. But it went deeper than that. They made a person have to buy from them an animal to sacrifice. They would reject many, not all, but they would reject many animals that were brought into by the people, declared that they were blemished in some way. It's more subjective than it was objective. That's what they did. And they forced a person to buy from them in order to sacrifice there during this Passover. A dove, listen, for, for example, a dove in the streets of Jerusalem would sell for about three and a half shekels. Now, that's on a non-holiday week. Now, in the temple at Passover, a dove would cost 75 shekels. It was a markup of 25 times, not 25%. <laughs> it's a markup of 25 times. That would be like, you know, if you had a bookstore, you used to have a bookstore, but you don't have one now, but if you had a bookstore and you had Bibles in there for sale for $500, but you could get that same Bible off Amazon for only $20. But the thing is, the Bibles from Amazon aren't blessed by the leadership of the church, you know, for those $500 Bibles in that way. They're more holy. Now, that was the idea. Of course, that wouldn't happen here, but that was the idea that took place back then. So I wanted you to get a comparison of that 25 times. It was unbelievable. They also made you change up your foreign currency, which was an, a, not an uncommon thing to do, you know, and put your money into the temple treasury. And so people would be coming into Jerusalem from all over the known world at this time, and they would, you know, at, at Passover. So their currency had to be exchanged to the currency of Israel, and they did all this at inflated, unbelievable inflated rates. I heard someone say that the chief priest made, compared to our day, around $3 million a year in income. They were millionaires. So the religious leaders are seeing the people with dollar signs in their eyes instead of ministry in mind. <laughs> Peter, you know, Peter warned the church in his epistle of those who come in and make merchandise of you, taking advantage of Christians in the church financially, in that way he talked about. So these religious leaders are doing that here. Now, I personally don't think, now this is just me personally, okay, so I'm not being dogmatic in any way, but I think personally, I don't think it would have been that traumatic to Jesus if the animals were there as a convenience for the people in case they might not have an animal. At the same time, giving the people a discount as a means of ministering to them. And the exchange of currency, not a big deal, potentially, if they're doing it at the going rate. What a witness that would have been to the Gentiles. What a witness that would have been to the Jews. I mean, that its leaders don't represent making a profit off of you but minister to you, providing things for you as a means of ministry. But that didn't happen. Because Jesus said, den of thieves. That means there was no ministry happening to the people. They were ripping people off. It was highway robbery there in the temple area. Now, the application that can be in this area for us is this, and it's up, I should be up on the screen, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who's in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own? You see, when people come into contact with Christians, they actually are coming in contact to Jesus that is in us, the hope of glory. We represent Christ. We're not on our own. We're not our own. At all. Whatever we do in word and deed, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever we do, whether we are conscious of it or not, whether we are doing it in his name or not, you know, the idea is we are representing Jesus to the world around us in this body, in this temple. 
And though we can think like the Pharisees and think, well, our temple is our temple, and I can do what I want with it. No, he has the authority over our temple, too. It's his sanctifying work that he's doing in our lives, setting us apart from the rest of the world. Jesus is not just Savior. He's Lord. He's authority. He's master in the same way. So here in our text, the temple that is God's house, not the religious leader's house, the temple is his temple. Not just our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is God's house. I allow Jesus' authority over my temple, over my life. But also note this with me, that Jesus says that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. In the same way, Christian, we are to be a house of prayer ourselves. Listen, our purpose and God's plan for our life becomes more clear when we are a people, a temple of prayer. His purpose is plan becomes more clear when we are a people, a temple of prayer. I'll give you an example of this. Back in Mark chapter 1, file back that far, <laughs> when you guys are, were there, one day, Jesus had, one day in the life of Jesus Christ began with the Sermon on the Mount. And then after that, he started calling disciples there on the Sea of Galilee. And then he started casting out demons. And then he cleansed the leper. And then he preached in the synagogue there in Capernaum. And then, after he preached the synagogue, he went over to Peter's house for his mother-in-law was going to make him lunch. And they get over there, and his mother-in-law is sick, so Jesus goes, I'll heal her too. And so he heals the mother-in-law, and she gets up and makes them all ham sandwiches. <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't know what she made them, but I'll guarantee it wasn't a ham sandwich, that's for sure, you know. <laughs> but she made him lunch. And then that evening, of course, when evening came, people started coming out, because actually that was the end of the Sabbath that day. And so people at the end of the Sabbath could come out, come to Jesus. And they all started coming to him. And he probably said for the wee hours of the night. Well, it says, you know, the next morning, Jesus was up a long while before daylight to go and pray. To go and pray. And as Jesus is praying, Peter interrupts his time of prayer to let him know people are looking for you. Where you been? You're the happening guy. I mean, this is what we've been waiting for, for this to happen, for this to take place, for, the, for this to be able to, you know, see all this happening. But Jesus said, and once again, it's up here on the screen, Mark 1, verse 38, he said, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. It was in prayer where God's plan and purpose became clear to Jesus. Not others' purpose and plan, not Peter's purpose and plan, nobody's purpose and plan. It was God's purpose and plan. It's in prayer where we find who is the authority over our lives when it comes to the plan and the purpose he has for our lives. Well, with that, let's go to verse 20, where it says, Now, in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. And as surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. So the day before, Jesus curses the fig tree. The next day, here it is, it's dried up from the roots. I mean, that's extremely fast. And the fact is that it withered proves that Jesus was stating what all these religious leaders promised in keeping rules and laws 
and traditions as authority, they cannot deliver. That was a sign to the disciples of Israel's unfaithfulness as a nation. They boasted in being fruitful, being in full leaf, you know, having everyone think they were so. But the reality was there was no spiritual fruit at all amongst them. So pretty much Jesus was just practically illustrating what would be the fall of Israel for the next 2,000 years. Because it's a fact, because they would not allow Jesus to rule. They would not allow Jesus the authority of being Lord and Savior. They would not allow that. The nation is just going to wither up spiritually. And a fig tree, along with the vine, they always represent in the Bible the nation of Israel. So that's what it represents, that fig tree does. You are going nowhere with your traditions, with your rules. There's no fruit in those things. Fruit begins with me, say Jesus, being the accepted authority over your lives, allowing me to come in, allowing me to clean house. That's where it lies. That's where fruit will lie. You don't want me to be that authority. You would rather destroy me. Thus, God's plan and purpose cannot be fulfilled in their life, in the nation of Israel's life as a nation. So from Peter's observation here of the fig tree, Jesus didn't say, yeah, this nation is blowing it. No, he didn't say that. He turned the attention to having faith in God to these guys, to his disciples. Just how huge faith is God truly is. God can do this. You can trust God. You need to trust God. Put your trust in God. Your faith is not in the religious leaders. Put your faith in God, not in them. You'll go nowhere with those guys. Faith in God will get you everywhere. Now, back to that little vignette here. It says it's kind of argued amongst people if if Jesus was literally speaking of a mountain into the sea, or was Jesus speaking metaphorically of that? And there's arguments on both sides. There's arguments on both sides, and there's strength on both ends of that. But listen, what's important for us is to know what Jesus might have been referring to. He might have been referring to the power of faith in God when faced with impossible situation. Now, a mountain into the sea is an impossible situation for you and I, not to God. So he may be speaking on that, the power of faith in God when faced with impossible situation. When you pray, don't doubt. James told us that too. Don't underestimate the power of faith in God if you exercise it in impossible situations. We'll come back to that. Look at verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, back to God's temple is a house of prayer. And we illustrate that for us in our bodies, our temple of the Holy Spirit. We should be a body, a temple of prayer. Because that's the place we will, when we pray, we'll find God's plan and his purpose for our lives. Keep that in mind. But Jesus is stating there will be that time when you are being a house of prayer. You're going to prayer. You are praying. And then it'll dawn on us, oh, I need to forgive them. I need to forgive them. But I believe the inference here is that we need to let them know we have forgiven them. Now, listen, I'm not a big fan of somebody walking up to me that I didn't know I, I offended or they, I, I didn't know they had unforgiveness towards me. But then they walk up to me and they walk up to me and they say, listen, I just want you to know for the last 20 years I've hated your guts and I wanted to kill you, and, but I've forgiven you now. <laughs> now I go, I, I'm looking around going, well, I, I had no idea this was even happening. I, I don't think it's, it's about that. I think this is where both parties know. Both parties know about it. And that one party knows that they need to be forgiven 
and the one needs to forgive them. I think that's the idea here. So God has the authority to forgive, and he's giving us the authority to forgive. And if I have been given you, which I have, then you must also give to others. If I've forgiven you, which I have, then you also must forgive others. That might be, for some of you, that impossible situation. But you've got to put your faith in God. Because you've been hurt. You've been abused. It's terrible. Terrible what somebody did to you. So that may be your impossible situation in that respect. To forgive is an extremely important act that we as his children who have received the forgiveness of our sin should forgive others of their sin also. Did you know that forgiveness is not only hugely important to do, it's hugely important for those you need to forgive. They did wrong. They need to know that you have forgiven them. There's a story. Ernest Hemingway tells a story about a father and a teenage son, Paco, whose relationship breaks down, which a lot of times that happens with fathers and teenage sons. But after the son runs away from home, the father begins this long journey in searching for him. Finally, as a last resort, the man puts an ad in the local newspaper in Madrid, Spain. It reads, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. The next morning, in front of the newspaper office, were 800 men named Paco. <laughs> They're desiring to be restored. They're desiring this broken relationship to be restored due to unforgiveness. Now, whether that's a true story or not, we kind of get the point of that. There's a human need to know that I am forgiven. That's why we came to Christ, to know that I'm forgiven. Remember that day when you came to Jesus and you realized you were forgiven of all your sins? It was one of the greatest feelings I ever had in my life. I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven by him. We knew that. We knew that. And that was such a great thing. Give the same respect to others, Jesus says, in the same way. Well, after Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers and the selling of animals and stopped the flow of money coming in the pockets of the chief priests and the other religious officials, it's recorded there in verse 18 once again that they, these guys, they sought how they might destroy him. In other words, they got together to plan Jesus' destruction. Destruction. So it's been suggested. It was a late night strategy session that took place that night when he cleansed the temple. So the Sanhedrin gathers. They put their heads together. And they come up with a plan for the next morning. The plan was we need to destroy his authority. We need to destroy him from being from God. We need to raise doubts into the people's minds. Authority is where we start. For authority must be destroyed. It must be destroyed. So look at verse 27. It says, then they came again to Jerusalem. That's they, the disciples, came into Jerusalem. And he, Jesus, was walking in the temple and the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you one question, then answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reason amongst themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. 
And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Authority was important to the people. Authority makes you respectable. Back then, back in March, I mean, Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, it said when Jesus had finished speaking there uh, on the Sermon of the Mount, it says that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. You see, when the scribes spoke, they didn't speak with authority. They didn't dare come to people like that, ever. No, they would quote a rabbi, Hillel, Shimei, well-respected rabbi, they would quote. They'd bring forth that respected rabbi's principles, their words, and those things. So when they spoke, they spoke on the authority of someone who was respected. Thus, that made their speaking acceptable. They never came on their own to anyone. And we understand that. I mean, I can, if I said, if I quote Winston Churchill, that's going to be respected by many of you. If I, if I quote C.H. Spurgeon, yes, well respected. Billy Graham, well respected. That's going to carry weight to listening ears. But if I'm sitting up here and go, well, listen, I'm going to quote myself from a couple of years ago, and here's what I said back, you're going to go, who's this guy? You know, you know, it's not going to be, you get what I'm saying, it's not going to be that well respected as when you bring forth other people of that way. So it gives us some understanding of how the scribes taught. It makes sense. But when Jesus taught, the people were hearing something that they never heard. He is the authority. It astonished them. So, to discredit Jesus, <laughs> to get him to lose respect, they all knew he didn't quote any rabbi or any religious leader. They all knew that. Then by what authority do you do these things? Now, if, number one, if Jesus was to answer directly and say, well, by my own authority, I quote myself, <laughs> they're going to go, yeah, right. He's going to, you know, that, it'd be a great exalted opinion of himself by doing something like that. Or number two, if Jesus didn't say his authority, but says by God's authority, then they accuse him of blasphemy. If Jesus was to say, well, I did this on the authority of their religious council, then they would say, you liar. We never gave you that authority. We never told you you could do that. See, it didn't matter which way they went. It didn't matter which way Jesus answered. You know, the end result would still be the same. They're going to get what they want. They're going to get what, it's kind of like the wife who didn't want to cook. She wanted to go out to a restaurant that night. And so when her husband gets home, the husband says, honey, what do we have for dinner? She goes, well, we're going to have a meatloaf experiment and beets. It doesn't matter what restaurant she goes to. She gets what she wants. She's going to go out and eat now. No man's going to eat a meatloaf experiment and beets, you know, for dinner. And it's the same with the religious leaders. It really doesn't matter which answer Jesus gives. They will get what they want. Him discredited. But before Jesus would give them an answer, he asked them a question back. Now, this was common back then. If someone was to ask you a question and expect an answer, then that person has the right to ask them a question. And they must give their answer back before you give your answer. If they don't answer, you don't have to answer. That was a very common thing. So Jesus wasn't avoiding the question or using a counter question as an evasive act. He wasn't doing that at all. Actually, Jesus questioned, listen, actually Jesus' question served as an answer to their question. It would serve as an answer to their question. Their answer, in Jesus' case, would have professed his authority. So, it was asked, was John's baptism of heaven or of men? Answer me, Jesus said. Now, if they would have answered, John is from heaven, and John pointing to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John who said, I'm not even fit to tie his sandals, John who said, I must decrease, he must increase, well, that answer would have proclaimed Jesus' authority. Their own answer would have answered the question. 
to answer from men, the religious leaders would have lost credibility. They would have lost authority. They would have lost respect with the people. For the people looked up to John as being from God. So they played ignorant. They shrugged their shoulders. I don't know. I don't know. Think about this. Just think about this with me. Jesus was stating, if you want to know about me and my authority and have an answer to your questions, you have to go back. You're going to have to go back and ask yourself, is John's baptism from heaven or from men? The truth about John will give you revelation and insight about me and my authority. You got to go back and ask yourself, heaven or men? There are times in our walk with Jesus Christ that we have to ask at times. We got to go back and ask, is God faithful or is he not faithful? Can I trust him or can I not trust him? It's just, you know, it's one or the other. It's cut and dry. It's e either way. One of the two. Can't mix them. Either he's faithful or he's not faithful. Either he can be trusted or he can't be trusted. When I falter in my faith, in God, in the impossible situations, my walk may come to a screeching halt. It may come to a screeching halt if I falter in my faith in God in impossible situations. I'll give you an example of this. Remember in the wilderness when Moses and Israel reached that place of an impossible situation of going to the land and conquering the giants? and taking what God had promised them, the land flowing with milk and honey. It wasn't impossible for, for God. It was impossible for them. And they faltered. They, they gave up on God. They didn't have faith in God in the impossible situation and circumstance of going into that land and conquering it. They wandered now aimlessly for the next 38 years. If I stop seeing him as my authority in my life and begin to question that authority of his word for my life as the absolute for my life, then what he has purposed for me is put on the back burner until I go back to that point and I go, is God faithful or is he not faithful? Can I trust him or can I not trust him? Got to go back. After 38 years of wandering, the next generation was taken back to that place of entering the promise and they were taken back to that place. And they had to decide, is God faithful in giving this, this land or is God not faithful? Does God have the authority to give us this land? They had to make a decision, and they made the right decision. He is faithful. You can trust him. And they went in, and they conquered it. So Jesus showed them here his authority in cleansing the temple. He has showed us his faithfulness and authority over sin by going to the cross for each and every one of us. We accept him as our Lord and as our Savior. He holds that authority over our lives. But when I begin to question his lordship, his authority over my life, my walk goes on hold. There's this impossible situation, let's say, in a relationship. This person who I have fallen in love with and I'm going to marry... They're not a Christian. The authority of God's word says, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Does a person's faith in God falter at that point? A person finds themselves kind of forgetting about God's authority and they take matters and authority back into their own hands. 
Because God's authority in his word, oh, I'll lose them. But my authority, I will keep them. A person finds themselves having to go back. Is God faithful or is he not faithful? Can I trust him or not trust him? Is his word faithful or is it not? Is, can I trust his word or not trust his word? One or two. There's no in between with any of those things. That's what happens. They have to go back. Can he be trusted or not trusted? Jesus, he made a strong point with that withering of the fig tree. Have faith in God, even in what might be an impossible situation there in verse 22. This walk of faith that we are to have is first centered on him being the authority of our life, him being Lord and Master. Peter, at the launching of the church there in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was given that incredible speech there in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, the last part of that verse, the beginning of the church, he said, this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's both Savior and Lord. Not just one. He's both. He made that clear. But notice which one is first. Lord. Authority is first. We make him savior of our lives first, and many times we leave off the Lord, the authority of him in our lives. We can forget we were bought at a price. We're a temple of his spirit. I'm his, so I need to trust him. A lot of people make Jesus their savior, but not Lord the authority over their life. The question is, does Jesus hold the authority of being Lord over my life? Or not? Can we trust him or not trust him? Is he faithful or is he not faithful? You see, his authority over and in our lives is paramount to our walk to his plan and purpose in all of our lives. 